Hello, welcome to Cashcroft TV. My name is Kaylin Ashcroft. Thanks for watching another video on history of leaders of thought. Today we will be doing Thomas Hobbes and Rene Descartes. So to start with Thomas Hobbes, so Thomas Hobbes also referred to as Thomas Hobbes of Malmesbury. He's most famous for his book written in fifteen or sorry sixteen fifty one titled Leviathan. I strongly recommend you read this. This kind of similar to the Prince was one of the earlier books on philosophy and politics that I read and I think has been particularly influential on me, not just in terms of generating my own ideas, but also just in terms of sparking an interest in philosophy generally. He's also known for his influence on history, jurisprudence, geometry, physics of gases, theology, ethics, and obviously general philosophy as is clearly outlined in his most famous book. So, to start off with his early life, and then we'll obviously get into the philosophy, he was born in Westport, which is now modern-day Malmesbury, or Wiltshire, England. He had a premature birth, so his mother feared the Spanish Armada were, um, would pose a threat to England at the time, so they gave birth, she gave birth to him early. Thomas Hobbes is quoted on birth saying, my mother gave birth to twins, myself and fear. So just to give a little bit of a context in terms of the time or the specific events that took place during his birth. So this probably had a pretty strong influence on generating his own philosophical ideas, which we will see and I'll draw a parallel to very soon. So very little is actually known about his childhood. In fact, we don't even know his mother's name, but his father, Sir Thomas Sr., um, was a vicar or uh, Charlton and Westport. He had a, an elder brother named Edmund, who was two years older, and a sister as well. It's said that his father, Thomas the Sr., was uneducated and in fact even disesteemed learning. So kind of surprising that Hobbes ended up becoming probably the most famous intellectual, at least for a period in Europe. His father was actually working in London and he got in a fight with the clergy outside of his own church, so he got sent outside of, out, kicked out of London. His uncle, um, sorry, Thomas Hobbes' uncle, Thomas Sr.'s brother, took them in he was a glove manufacturer pretty wealthy glove manufacturer and he took in the whole family and he had no family of his own so maybe it's not explicitly said but maybe this individual had a stronger predisposition towards learning and might have rubbed off on Hobbes but nonetheless he wasn't receiving this sort of um, inspiration from his father he started at school at Westport Church at the age of four then he went to Malsbury School, uh, where the head of the school was an Oxford alumni, so following in suit, he went to Magdalen Hall, which is now part of Hertford College in Oxford. Said throughout, he was a pretty uh, stellar student, so he didn't necessarily have the most powerful family. In fact, they were definitely um, of a higher class, but obviously it wouldn't have merited getting him into... Uh, Oxford with little effort so nonetheless his his efforts unlike some of our perhaps previous philosophers not to name any specifically we could attribute a little bit more of Hobbes' success to his own personal merit rather than in perhaps some others he at Magdalen Hall he studied scholastic logic and physics so probably I would say the two most um, respected fields to go into at the time just prior to starting, he actually tra translated Ep uh, Euripides' tragedy, Medea, from Greek into Latin. So obviously he must have spoke, been able to at least read and write in Greek and Latin, respectively. But it also outlines his interest in the classics, which I think, with the exception of Descartes, as I'll um, explain very shortly, it seems to be almost every single philosophy had a passion for the classics. He sort of disliked the sort of conventional scholastic curriculum and he sort of went alongside his own curriculum where he filled it with whatever courses he wanted. So he was very much self-taught despite him having a somewhat standardized education. Ultimately, he received a BA 
in conjunction with St. John's College in Cambridge. So he kind of, I guess he was studying at both institutions. So he pretty much, I would say, had a had a broad grasp of the whole political and social climate in England at the time, which would make a good foundation for his writings to come. At Magdalen, he had a... He served as William's tutor, William Cavendish's son, Earl of Devonshire. So, obviously, he starts getting... Although his fa father was pr pretty powerful, he starts getting involved in even more powerful families just through his, firstly, his proximity by going to the right schools, but also by, I think he was very good at pleasing the right people. And we'll see, and that might be very much like, as we see in Machiavelli, the, the ability to please people to get to one's own success. So, in terms of his relationship with these Cavendishes, so, ultimately, there's, I'll try not to um, get too confusing here, there's a William the Senior, and who, who's Earl of Devonshire, and then he has a son, who also becomes a Earl of Devonshire, and he ends up serving as the uh, son's tutor, and later even some other family members in the Cavendish. So at this time, it's said that he might have been sort of at least n not a monarchist, quote-unquote. We can't say he was an anti-monarchist, but he was sort of more pro the uh, nobility at the time as opposed to the monarchs. But that obviously changes, as we'll very soon see. He, he wrote uh, this book called Elements of Law, which he de dedicated to William. So this is probably one of his first pieces of writing. Another thing to note is that the Cavendishes were actually financing the king's army during the Civil War. So despite him not actually working directly for the monarch, he was still spending time with a family that was did have quite strong sympathies towards the monarch. He took what's called a grand tour. So it was very con common, and they, we still have that pretty much today I could I'd say I did a very much similar thing but after he studied he went for five years traveling around where he um, traveling around Europe to namely Venice and Florence and all the intellectual capitals of the of the European world he studied scientific and critical methods he really found that what he was learning on his grand tour was quite different from the scholasticism he was experiencing in Oxford and he quite and quite preferred it. He focused very much on the classics as well, actually particularly on the classics. He translated Thucydides, who was the great historian who wrote History of the Peloponnesian War. So I covered that life, specifically Thucydides, and the Peloponnesian War is worth, very, very worth studying. It would be a good place to start in terms of uh, any history course. So obviously very passionate about the classics. He in 1628, Cavendish's, uh, one of the Cavendishes died and the widow dismissed him, but fortunately after he goes to Paris and Florence for a time to start writing and such, but Cavendish, the third Earl, hires him up again, so he's, he's not really left with unemployment for very long. And it's this time when he's, when he's in Paris um, that he writes, he, he starts writing and starts seeing the the quote that we'll allude to later, the brutishness and misery of um, of man that man might experience. So I think I think one can tell, and it's not he doesn't explicitly say it, or he didn't necessarily write an autobiography of his travels, but he must have seen some um, very Candide like or Voltaire like, if you understand that reference. Um, events in his travels to have come up with his specific philosophy. So in 1642, the English Civil War breaks out. 1644, many people who were supporting the royalist cause were forced to leave England, and many came to France. So this obviously caused Hobbes quite a bit of worry, but at the time, he was actually studying mathematics, so he was not um, in too much too much trouble, but he republished De Siva, which is his, one of his earlier books on um, uh, states. So 
or civics. With this, and after seeing sort of the clash between the monarchy and the nobility he was experiencing in in the United in England at the time, he decided to write Leviathan. Uh, for protective reasons or for personal reasons, it's hard to tell, but essentially, I'll go into it in much more detail, but the concept of the Leviathan is that a state must be, the human is inherently evil, so they, and the, I guess, yeah, the human, when, when their, their power is left untap, unchecked, they will infinitely seek out power, so therefore the monarch must have some kind of absolute control to keep them under control, and that is part of the formulations of the social contract theory. The social contract, there's actually a book by Jean-Jacques Rousseau called The Social Contract, which I'll be explaining more clearly, but Hobbes actually sort of alludes to these ideas before Jean-Jacques Rousseau. The one of the main questions in this book is: Does the subject have the right to change allegiance with a former sovereign power to protect? Um, if if the sovereign loses its power to protect, does the sovereign still hold the power? So we'll get to that also in more clear uh, detail. For a period for six months, he was sick. He nearly died, but uh, ultimately in 1650 he completed the book. He and after completing Leviathan, he was considered the most decried and most lauded individual in all of Europe. So the book was debatable whether you consider it a success, but at least it was famous. So if in terms of absolute terms, it definitely reached a lot of people. Did it make a lot of people happy? Not necessarily. And it sort of, yeah... The Anglicans were very upset by it. The French Catholics were very upset with it, um, particularly because it's secularist nature. He was forced to flee from the English government because the English government was having a lot of sort of anti-monarchist movements. So obviously him writing a book that pretty much um, advocates for a, a monarchy even more so than the prince by Machiavelli would have and at a later date would have obviously caused a huge stir. Uh, Hobbesism became a term, a uh, derogatory term to refer to someone who, or a non-respectable society. But fortunately for him, Charles II, who was the king of England, really did like the book, so he actually offered Thomas Hobbes a pension. He was criticized of atheism and... Um, um, by the House of Commons, and yeah, but he he came to his own defense at this. So he he, I th I think it's very strange that he was by so many considered atheist an atheist. I guess today we have a sort of different term for atheist. Atheist now sort of means someone who doesn't believe, but back then atheist was more just someone who had perhaps some ideas that were inconsistent. So. Hobbes was obviously, obviously religious. If you actually read the book Leviathan, almost as much as a third is heavy, heavy analysis of religious texts. Um, so much so when I first read it, I got I got through all the first portion, but once I got to the later latter portions, having not uh, been familiar enough with biblical texts or ecclesiastical studies, it really um, blew over my head at that point. So, obviously, I would say he was extremely, if we were to call someone like that an atheist today, then what would not be an atheist? But either way, he, he went to his own defense, so he defended himself in court, um, express, demonstrating his own legal abilities, but also the king, Charles II, also helped him out as well there. But despite this, he got off sort of pretty much free, but his one restriction was that he was no longer allowed to make pr publications on human conduct because he was seen as dangerous in England. So he continued to write some in Amsterdam, but a lot less on politics and a lot more on other topics. He wrote an autobiography, and lastly, one of his final works was a translation of four books of the Odyssey, which is now sort of embedded in the most modern English translations of the Odyssey and the Iliad as well that we now can read today. And if you don't know those, the Odyssey and the Iliad are by Homer, but I, I hope that you do know that.
So to kind of get to the actual philosophy, in terms of political thought, he thought that a state or society could not be secure unless at the disposal of an absolute monarchy. Um, I think that's... Um, I've, I explained that. No individual can hold rights of property against the sovereign, so this expands on that. So, therefore, the sovereign owns all the goods of the lands, and they can take any goods. An example was used in the 1630s, where Charles I sought to raise revenues without parliamentary consent. So, Hobbes would have advocated that the, the king could have done so. There's... Um, I guess we're going uh, going to some. I think this is the main quote here to sum it up. In such condition, there is no place for industry. So the the condition he says in a condition without a monarchy, um, because the fruit thereof is uncertain. So there's no monarch to protect the goods, for example, and consequently no culture on earth, no navigation, no use of commodities that may be imported by sea. No commodious building, no instruments of moving and removing, such things require much force. No knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society, and which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death. And the life of man, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. So the most famous part is the life of man, solitary, poor, poor nasty, brutish, and short. So basically, without a monarchy to sort of sort of people agree to this social contract and they sort of give up their um, their rights but they also gain the rights of security and that is the social contract and it only works in the Hobbesian case with a monarchy so I think I, I was I had a discussion with a friend the other day and I I posed the Hobbesian argument without um, sort of putting in my own uh, uh, perception of it and I said, for example, in, in the case of a oligarchy, if, for example, there are five rulers, six rulers, I think it's almost impossible for, even in a case if there's only five, for one of them not wanting to, to not want more power. I think Hobbes is getting at a real key, um, I guess, psychological phenomenon that greed is almost limitous, limitless unless one is just given it all and that's what he sort of saw here and obviously there are some short-term consequences of having a monarch for example they could abuse things they could overtax they could raise too much money they could cause unnecessary war but in the long term it would be a more stable state at least that's what Hobbes believes there he thought this was and one of the ways he wrote Leviathan was actually, you'll see, very much similar to, as you might have seen in The Prince, uh, he sort of takes it from a very scientific standpoint, which was starting to become a more conventional thing, but it wasn't um, too conventional at the, t the time. I think one thing that's very important to note is actually this this cover of it. Um, I have, it's I think it's I'd be upset if it wasn't included on every copy because it's it's a very famous copy. Essentially, this is the Leviathan, and you can't really see it here, but it's made of a bunch of little people. So the monarch is symbolically the controller, kind of all parts of one. But um, my point here is that the his um, he showed a lot of forethought in incorporating art into his work. I think it had did help with the publicity and the fame and notoriety of the book but even i've said this many times before for example some, one such as oops, homer who didn't even write at all but he put his ideas regarding morality into art and that's what made the writing of Ho uh, the writing of homer outlast anything socrates even produced so no, Socrates didn't write anything, and he didn't put it into art. So I just think there's got to give credit where credit is due. I think Hobbes was um, effective in using art to also push his phil um, philosophical and political ideas. So in a state without um, a monarch, it's war against all. Um, he had no division of powers, though, which I think you could probably have guessed at this point. Uh, 
So civil, military, judicial, ecclesiastical, and even speech were all controlled by the king. So there's a cool discussion by um, in Dostoevsky's brothers Karamazov, where one of the brothers, D Dmitri, is having a discussion with a a church, um, a clergyman essentially, and they're discussing whether or not the church and state should a in fact actually be separated at the time it had been separated. So Hobbes probably would have advocated for combining the two. Um, it's a huge discussion, and even from reading Dostoevsky, there's th he doesn't give an answer, because Dostoevsky usually puts his own ideas through the lens of Alyosha, the main character. He explicitly says Alyosha is the main character, but he never clearly says what his stance is on this. Um, yeah, he was heavily cons uh, criticized for uh, atheism, as I mentioned before, but obviously he did believe in God. He was just some contrary beliefs. He did support um, what John Locke would later expand on as true revelations in that um, uh, in that human reason and experience were driven by a sword of God and they were um, causing things but not with the deterministic nature that Aristotle had so finite points but I think if in today's terminology to refer to him as an atheist would just be um, to completely uh, miss, miss the point in terms of mathematics, he wrote this book called De Corpore. Uh, he wrote an erroneous proof of squaring a circle, which John Wallace heavily disputed. But um, either way, his, his influence on mathematics is uh, far overshadowed by his influence on uh, politics through specifically Leviathan. And that's probably um, an inverse version of that of Descartes. So I'll go through these quotes here, and then we'll get into him more in the comparison. Um, oh, and I guess, sorry, one last thing as well, his death. So he died of a bladder disorder, and then he had a paralytic stroke. And his last quote was, a great leap in the dark. So I think that's symbolically him going into, into whatever could become could be after his life and that could be seen as something as an atheistic statement but i don't think he meant it as such but it's interesting that he died of a, a bladder disorder and a paralytic stroke because some of our um our, our previous it, it, well just in this time period it seemed to be pretty pretty common way for people to die so uh yeah the quotes are my mother gave birth to twins myself in fear the contradiction so that one I, I mentioned earlier but the point is that he was born in a time where there was the, the fear of the Spanish Armada so there was he it, it's easy to see where one might come to the conclusion that life is poor nasty brutish and short and everyone it's war against everyone war for and against everyone so that's the next quote the condition of man is a condition of war of everyone against everyone so it's obvious that he could see this Leisure is the mother of philosophy. So, um, I don't know, it's a short quote, but I, I liked it. I thought I'd put it in. The point is that I think if you're studying philosophy, um, I would actually take a different approach. I think you would should not approach... I think if you approach it as leisure, you'll probably spend a lot more time experiencing philosophy. But I think if you approach it solely from a leisurely perspective, it won't be rigorous enough to actually come to any useful conclusions it is not wisdom but authority that makes law so that's essentially saying if we don't have a king who has all the power and there's just these laws without any sort of military authority or anything like that there's they don't they're not really laws they're just kind of like game rules words are wise men's counters they do not reckon with them but they are the money of fools. So, um, I think it's a, a little bit of a hypocritical statement because he thought, he obviously, believed in the usefulness of words. But I think what he's really targeting at that is that a lot of fools will use words when they don't, in fact, really know the meaning of them. So, yeah, that's Thomas Hobbes. Um, I guess before moving on, my last last thing I'd say is just my own personal perspective whether um, a monarch is 
better for a state. Firstly, I do think a bigger state would need more centralized power. I think it's just better for operational reasons, but um, I don't think it necessarily has to be a monarch, but there has to be a strong enough central government sufficient to make the laws laws as referenced here, but also sufficient enough to sort of suppress the endless greed. For example, you don't want to have some, I don't know, senator or secretary of defense trying to limitly take power. There should be someone, perhaps a president or a prime minister, who has, um, at least for their elected period, some sort of absolute authority. So, yeah. Th these are very hard things, and obviously this could change in the future too, but these are things that you should be thinking of too, and I, I, I challenge you to maybe come up with a reason why Hobbes is wrong. Uh, as time for Rene Descartes. So Rene Descartes also has a very important place in the heart as well. I think I was, it was in, I think, first year calculus in high school. So I had a really great um, calculus pr professor who has a, I don't know, she had, she had a PhD in Romania or something like that, but she was very smart. And she was really fascinated in Rene Descartes. She was the first to mention the quote to me, I think, therefore I am, which is actually kind of an um, uh, in, incorrect um, translation of the quote, but either way, but she really got, I, I think it, it was a cool experience in my life because I was just, I was fascinated in the mathematics. Calculus is where mathematics really starts getting exciting and fascinating, derivatives and integrals, really checking the, the visuals of it. For example, in integral, you get to see the area under the curve and just you get to start doing some really cool stuff. But she was uh, obviously a very uh, strict professor. She would, you know, scare a lot of students, call them up to the board and make them, um, I don't know, do proofs and whatnot. But something she did that I hadn't experienced any other math teacher doing was she actually incorporated some philosophy into her class. So she, she mentioned not just Rene Descartes' influence on mathematics, but also his influence on other facets. So I had not really experienced that in my life. It's almost strange how the education system, at least where I grew up, is intentionally separated. For example, you go to one room and you study your social studies, and then you leave the room physically and then go into a mathematics room when perhaps there could be a lot of synergies between the two. So he was a French philosopher, mathematician, and scientist. He was from the French kingdom, but he spent most of his life, or the most of his prolific writing periods, 20 years in the Dutch Republic. He was um, a mercenary, so he kind of, as we might have seen with Tycho Brahe, in, in our discussion with Tycho Brahe and Copernicus, he was a little bit more boisterous than Hobbes, at least, for and being willing to join the mercenary army. And he served the mercenary army for the Dutch States Army, the Prince of Orange in France, and the United Province of the Netherlands. So he was kind of almost agnostic in terms of countries. He's considered one of the founders of modern philosophy, but also note that Hobbes was also, is also considered one as well. He draws some conclusions from Aristotelianism and revised Stoicism, but also other philosophers such as Augustine of Hippo, who I have also discussed. He something he did that noticeably different from these was he did not divide human into the corporeal substance, matter, and form. So he thought that they were actually they could be described distinctly, but they could not be separated. I'll expand on that soon. And he didn't like final ends or divine or natural explanations, which a lot of other philosophers has had used as kind of a a secret way out or a secret way of solving a lot of issues that. Descartes believed had never actually been fully solved. In theology, he believed in absolute freedom of God's act of creation. Passion, he wrote this book called Passions of the Soul, where he has this quote, write as if no one has written on those matters before. So basically, he thought he was completely original. So um, one of our more cocky or arrogant philosophers we're speaking of now. In Discourse on the Method of and principles of philosophy, that's where he has his quote, I think, therefore I am, foundation of ras rationalism, so he heavily influenced Spinoza and Leibniz, who I plan on covering as well. He's criticized by the empiricists, such as, well, I don't think 
they necessarily did, but his, their camps, such as Hobbes and Locke and Berkeley and Hume, but Hobbes was a little bit before anyways. Spinoza and Leibniz, um, they used, heavily drew off his founding of analytical geometry, which is a way in which he kind of combined algebra and geometry at the time, which ultimately set a foundation for finding, um, uh, for infinitesimal calculus and just pretty much modern mathematics as we have it today, as we'll very, very soon see. So his, I would say his influence on mathematics is only rivaled by, I, I, would, I, I would say there, his, his mathematics would have been his greatest achievement if not for his, um, I think therefore I am, so... Um, yeah, so you could uh, you could, you could almost say he was more of a mathematician than a philosopher. It's debatable, and that's up to you. And thus, I, I'll, I'm jumping ahead, but for example, the Cartesian plane, which is an incredibly, incredibly important thing in terms of mathematics, and anyone who does any sort of mathematics probably looks at l least one of these a day, is named after René Descartes, so very important. So he was born in La Haye on Touraine, which is now called Descartes, named after him in Indre et Loire. His mother died in childbirth, so not as um, not exactly the same as Hobbes. Hobbes' mother feared the Spanish Armada and gave a premature birth, but Descartes' mother died in childbirth, so maybe even harsher. But either way, I think it's important to note that they both had a sort of tumultuous, at least, first period in their life. His father's name was Joachim, uh, who was a Brit member of parliament for Brittany, Brittany and Reims. He grew up Roman Catholic, but in the region, there was a lot of Protestant Huguenots. So Huguenots were the sort of the British coming down and sort of spreading their Protestant ways and ultimately led to um, many wars between the Catholics and Protestants. But either way, he might have been growing up, might have felt a bit like a minority being a Catholic in a majority protestant region but at the same time also the country as a whole was catholic so he might have felt some sort of superiority there which is hard to say but nonetheless he seems to be generally he's generally religiously agnostic which is somewhat of a newer thing that we're seeing in philosophers and i think the same could be said for hobbes hobbes was i would say religiously agnostic as well his first school was jesuit college he had to start a little bit late because he was suffering from sickness. He studied math and physics in La Fleche, um, also the Jesuit College. Um, he, and he got familiar with Galileo as well there. So He went to University of Pontier, which is a famous f university that some of our most recent philosophers had attended. And he ultimately received a baccalaureate in canon and civil law because his father, Joachim, wanted him to be a lawyer, which is um, still a very common thing for parents to want today. And it was still a common thing back then. I saw a cool quote the other day, and I don't want to go on too much of a tangent, but they said that the West is our countries led by lawyers, whereas the East are countries led by engineers. And... Um, by the East, I think they're referring specifically to the countries such as China, Japan, and Korea, whereas most people in the West who have any sort of political career have a legal background. But I'm just going on a tangent there. Either way, his father thought he would be better, or it would be better for the family if he went into law. But nonetheless, that's not what he did. He said, um, here's a, a quote that sort of breaks off his life. I entirely abandoned the study of letters, resolving to seek no knowledge other than that of which I could be found in myself or else in the great book of the world. I spent the, the part of my youth traveling, visiting courts and armies, mixing with people of diverse temperaments and ranks, gathering various experiences, testing myself in the situations which fortune offered, offered me and at all times reflecting upon whatever came my way as that I derive some profit from it. So basically he's saying he's moving away from 
he says letters, but I think that's referring to all readings, and he wanted to grow by getting experience. So kind of like the grand tour that Hobbes went on, he spent a long time just traveling and experiencing it. But the very last bit where he says he made sure to reflect on that which he experienced to profit from it. So it's not one thing, I think a lot of people today still do these grand tours and go on traveling, but they don't maybe approach it in the same way as Hobbes and Descartes did in terms of reflection and actually trying to um, actively grow. In 1618, he finally gets his wish and becomes a military officer as a mercenary for the Protestant Dutch States Army in Breda. So, obviously not like, sort of against his father's will. He starts studying military engineering under Simon Steven. So, this is where he gets interested in mathematics originally. They studies free fall, catenary, conic section, and fluid statistics. So, he was this is a time where they were actually starting to be able to combine mathematics and physics, which had long been a sort of difficulty among some of the previous astronomers, well, specifically astronomers, but Descartes wasn't an astronomer, but my point is that he combined mathematics and astronomy. Said that he was involved in the Battle of White Mountain in Prague, which is a famous battle. So just to kind of, um, I guess, paint a clearer picture as to some of the experiences Descartes must have been experiencing. In 1619, it said that he had a vision. So he was in a room with a, like a cold room, but he had an oven running and he had three dreams. And this is where he hypothesized analytical geometry, which is algebra and geometry quiet combined, infinitesimal calculus and philosophy. And this is ultimately where, which led to his quote, I think, therefore I am. So, um, some say that it wasn't actually visions, he was actually having some kind of sickness bout, but nonetheless, I think the history likes to sort of dramatize his or anyone's great thoughts. So, yeah, exploding head syndrome is what he might have been having. So eventually he returns to France after serving as a mercenary, and he goes to La Haye, and he sells all of his property in, ex in return for bonds. So he buys a bunch of bonds, and these pay his interest for his life. So um, two things. Either A, he was just so unfinancially uninclined that he did not have any better use of his money than to put it all into bonds, or he was so financially savvy that he looked at the interest rates on these bonds and he figured it out that he could never had to work another day in his life and could just live off the interest of these bonds. So either you could con consider him a brilliant financier or a brilliant um, person in terms of managing their finance or um, just completely lazy, hard to say. He was involved in the Siege of Rochelle Rebellion and... Um, yeah, ultimately, he wrote his first essay on method during this time while he's back in France, and then he returns back to the Netherlands. In 1628, goes to the University of Frank Franeker, and he lives with a Catholic family, so maybe alluding to the fact that he is a little bit more partial to Catholics, but nothing. I haven't found anything of that sort in his writings. He also spent time in Amsterdam where he met this servant girl and they had a daughter who unfortunately died at the age of five. But I think um, we're starting to, well, I don't think this is particularly um, representative of the philosophers, but perhaps representative of the upper class was a lot of the more forward thinkers were starting to open up their relationships to poor and lower class people because they're probably starting to see that the difference was more just a monetary one than actually anything to do with um, compatibility. He went to Leiden University where he actually uses a fake name, Poitevin. So why does he use a fake name? Perhaps because he was already starting to get famous or perhaps because he wanted to try something new. It's hard to say, but I think it's important to note. Here he studies mathematics. He works on Poppus's hexagon theorem, and he also starts getting um, studying some more astronomy, sort of in light of, once again, Galileo. Gets accused of plagiarism on some of these fronts by an individual named Beckman, but I think we can safely brush this claim aside because he has so many things that were not plagiarized that I think to 
just completely defame Descartes for a couple times where he did plagiarize, I think would be to once again miss the point. So essentially he sends 20 years in Amsterdam, or in, sorry, the Netherlands. Amsterdam is in the Netherlands, but I think he was traveling around, not just in Amsterdam. He spent 20 years there, and this is where he produces all of his major works. He writes this one in book called Treaties of the World, which he actually delayed because Galileo was being condemned by the Italian Inquisition. So, But in this book, he outlines four rules for thought, which is um, very very useful um, philosophical idea the first of which was the first was never to accept anything for true which i did not clearly know as such so kind of alluding to i think therefore i am following this he goes to sweden because he had became europe's most famous philosopher and scientist so this is already after he had produced all of his most famous works during those 20 years and his book passions of the soul which he wrote to elizabeth what got attention from Queen Christina of Sweden. So she wanted him to create a scientific academy where he would tutor her on love. He accepted this and he was living just 500 meters away from the castle in Sweden. But he had to show up at 5 a.m. three days a week and they proved to not actually be very compatible. The queen was very fascinated in the classics whereas Descartes and unlike pretty much every other philosopher, was not very interested in the classics, and even just directly, unlike Hobbes, who was very interested in the classics. Similarly, she did not like his sort of formulaic or to-the-book ways of teaching. Ultimately, he ends up dying of pneumonia, perhaps because the room he was teaching was so cold, he was just getting somewhat older, but he wasn't even that old. He's actually pretty young, but uh, some say he was assassinated, he, he had to drink this drink called an emetic, which is actually wine and marijuana, which um, two substances people still consume to this day. Um, some say that uh, he was maybe murdered or assassinated. I think that seems unlikely. I think even if the queen didn't like him, I don't think she would murder him just because he, he neglected the classics. I don't think she was that passionate. He was Catholic, but uh, at the time Sweden was predominantly Protestant, so there was nowhere to bury him, so he was for a time buried in an orphan graveyard. Then the French considered burying him in the Pantheon, which is like pretty much the best place to be buried, unless you consider where Napoleon's buried in Les Invalides. Um, but instead, he was buried at the uh, Abbey Saint Germain, which is also a very, very great place to be buried. But he was condemned by the Pope his books were included in the index of prohibited books louis the 14th prohibited cartesian lectures louis the 14th is the sun king one of my favorite um i'd like to do a perhaps a history series maybe kind of in the style of ancient greek and roman history maybe a parallel lives between history of england and france i think that would be a cool one so yeah i guess we'll start talking about his philosophy now so his most famous quote i think thought cannot be separated from me therefore i exist so that often gets changed into i think therefore i am but i think it misses a few quick key points so i'll i'll explain that again so i think is the first part thought cannot be separated from me so this gets to his concept of dualism so the the soul and the body cannot be separated so thought cannot be separated from me which is an important part that is missed in the paraphrase quote therefore i exist so i think there's just an important extra element that's often neglected so i think thought cannot be separated from me therefore i exist doesn't read as well but i think it's more much more uh, clear and meritorious so essentially from this he thinks um it's in terms of through a method of deduction that to merely doubt one's existence the doubting proves one's existence so it's almost um a paradox in that regards so in terms of dualism so it's called cartesian dualism so mind and body are distinct they can be described separately um but they cannot be separated so unlike god where god is a distinct and separate thing the human soul cannot be separated from the body 
and he used a famous example of wax to describe this. Obviously, wax has no soul. In terms of physiology and psychology, he saw that the passions of the soul were driven by animal-like instincts. So even reflexes were some kind of, like, if you get burned, it would be an animal-like instinct. He actually found a specific part in the brain called the penile gland, which he attributed to the connection between the the, the material and the non-material soul. Is the penile gland actually responsible for that? No, I don't. Um, no. But I think the point is perhaps he might have been doing some... Um, um, actual examinations of brains like physical brains so perhaps he was doing some um, exper um, experimentations in hospitals or something of that regards he believes that are, there are six feelings wonder, love, hatred desire, joy and sadness personally I don't really um, like this because I think that if I like to think of it as a quadrant, but I don't think that, uh, for example, joy, joy and sadness are one spectrum, right? You can't sim. I don't think you can simultaneously be joyful or sadness. I would think of it as like a spectrum. Joy is like ten, sadness is like negative ten. So I think you could cut down these six to three. But this is a finite point, and if Descartes would be here, I would certainly not. Um, try to debate with him in fact i would just do nothing but praise him so but i just wanted to give my own perspective on that he thought that the soul was divine so if for well the, he thought that the soul was not necessarily divine sorry so it could be studied and this sort of opened up a huge discussion for those such as alan turing and um, as far as everything in psychology um ivan pavlov you know, famous for Pavlov's dog, specifically referenced Descartes as one of their influences. Um, yeah, in terms of moral philosophy, so he thought that ethics could be treated as a science. He was what's called a rationalist, so he thought that um, reason is the way to achieve virtue, and, re and reason was sufficient, so just by continuously using more and more reason, you can become more virtuous. Um, but reason and virtue can also be infected by the conditions of one's body. So this sort of opened up to a whole new um, kind of even modern medicine. Now people are looking into holistic health, right? If somebody is depressed, they don't just look at the brain, right? You have to perhaps look at the holistic package. Maybe they have some kind of physical ailment. Maybe they could get in better shape. Maybe that would help the, the depression, and I think in those cases, for example, it would be true. So just starting to open up some new trains of thoughts here. Um, you believe in what's called the sovereign good or somun borum, bonum, um, which essentially is freedom of the mind. But um, Aristotle thought that you know, goods and fortune did play a, a fact in terms of one's happiness, but Descartes didn't like to associate with these, and he criticized Aristotle saying that goods and fortune were obviously up to fortune, so they couldn't be controlled, and reason alone could be the only contributing factor to virtue. In terms of religion, he has these two proofs. There's the trademark argument and the ontological proof. Um, they're quite long and extensive, but both of them pretty much outline that not only does God exist, but also that they or he is benevolent. So I think this is kind of, I think, surprising for Descartes, because Descartes is the individual who breaks down everything so much to the extent that does one even exist? Then he gets, I think, therefore I am. But then so many people are were still battling with does God exist or does not exist? Then Descartes pushes it to the next level, saying not only does he or it exist, it is benevolent too. So that is, I think, pretty uh, profound point there. He's obviously not an atheist, but he was accused of being an atheist, once again, because there were some incompatibilities. But Descartes, unlike Hobbes, did not address this issue. He sort of uh, 
avoided any incompatibility. So, you know, I kind of painted the picture that Descartes was the more boisterous one. He was the mercenary. He was not willing to fight on this discussion. In terms of natural science, well, I guess not even natural science. Here's how he sort of perceived thought. So the f tree of philosophy. So metaphysics is the root of this tree. And from there, they're span out into medicine, mechanics, and ethics. And pretty much all teaching comes from those uh, branches. He thought that morals is the highest part of the tree and it's the last degree of wisdom. But I think one can derive from this that one cannot discuss morals unless one has discussed metaphysics, for example. So, in terms of animals, despite him believing that humans had animal instincts, he thought that animals could not feel pain or anxiety. They had no souls and no consciousness. Darwin ultimately is the one who leads to this being refuted and saying that we, you know, we came from a dog, so therefore it probably has a consciousness. But I think Descartes, I don't think he was the guy, if he saw a dog on the street, he'd beat it or something like that. I think he was just trying to point is that, you know, it, it's already so hard to prove that I exist. How can I prove that dog thinks? So that it would just be too much of a stretch and it would undermine some of his previous thoughts. In terms of math, where his influence is almost bigger, he comes up with Cartesian analytical geometry, as I mentioned, but he started using for his system of equations, not X, Y, Z, as we now have today, or X and Y axis. He used A, B, and C, but nonetheless, he started using equations like that. He was also the one to pioneer superscripts, hugely important. A superscript is like this is X with a superscript of two, X to the power of two, hugely, hugely important. Obviously, they had squares and such, but they did not have a standard way of writing that. So once again, a huge um, uh, innovation for him. But uh, he did not necessarily um, create this Cartesian plane, but it has been named after him. And he probably used something quite similar to it. My teacher, um, my calculus teacher who I alluded to before said that he at one time was lying on his bed and saw flies moving on the room and he sort of decided to plane them. Um, I haven't heard too many specific anecdotes of this since I heard that story, but I like to assume it's true. And I like to perhaps put it during that time where he was having those visions, maybe when he was lying in that bed and came up with, I think, therefore I am. He also came up with this Cartesian plane during those, during one of his six sick periods. So he also had an influence on, oh, oh yeah, sorry. And I guess ultimately his analytical geometry ended up having a huge influence on calculus, um, which Newton and Leibniz expanded on from him, which I've already said. Uh, in terms of optics, he created a law of refraction called Snell's Law, and which um, also determined that angular radius of a rainbow is 42 degrees. So just once again, explaining what a polymath this individual really was. Um, now he was, there's a Paris Descartes University named after him. The region he was born in is now called Descartes. There's a moon crater named after him and an asteroid named after him. So obviously very, very important. And uh, yeah, in terms of the quotes, develop each difficulty into as many parts as is feasible and necessary to resolve it. So break things down to first principles, I guess would be the best um, way of uh, paraphrasing it. And that's where I think he came up with his most important question, um, existence itself. It is not enough to have a good mind. The main thing is to use it well. I think that's self-explanatory. Um, I think he put his mind to very great use. The reading of all good books is like a conversation with the finest minds of past centuries. So I think um, I mentioned this in the previous book, just like, you know, you're an abstraction, the five people you spend the most time with. But that also includes books. You know, if you spend 20% of your time reading Aristotle, you're going to be 20% Aristotle, which is absolutely profound. And like we saw in previous life, there is these people will never say no to you. I, that was Machiavelli he said, you know, they embrace me. They, when you pick up a book, they're never going to be mean to you. They're just going to tell you it isn't it is. So very important. If you would be so, um, if it would be a real seeker of truth, it is necessary that at least once in your life, you doubt as far as possible all things so that's what he did and i think he thought he was somewhat 
superior to other thinkers just because he went that far. And the greatest minds are capable of the greatest vices as well as the greatest virtues. So this is a very, very uh, nice quote, and I put it at the end because it's, I don't know, it's my favorite one that's up here. Um, so there's a quote by uh, Napoleon. He basically says, great ambition um, could be used for great good or great evil or something along those lines. Same thing, great minds are great, capable of great vice and great virtues. Same thing, another one would be Spider-Man. With great power comes great responsibility. And I think that is something that Descartes recognized. And I think that's why he, despite having a sort of boisterous nature, he didn't necessarily pick as many fights and he wasn't, didn't go so far as, for example, Bra, who had a sword fight in the dark and got his nose cut off. So, yeah, that's Descartes. In terms of the comparison between the two, I think there are many. Um, Descartes, I think, was slightly more broad Hobbes did involve himself in mathematics, but I think he was obviously much, much more famous for his work on politics than anything else that he um, really produced. Whereas Descartes, you could almost say his influence on mathematics was bigger than that which he produced in philosophy. There's also, um, Descartes had a bigger impact on optics. But um, also, at the same time, Descartes is more foundational, so all of these ideas we're not, you don't really talk about them as much today, whereas Hobbes's philosophy is still heavily debated today. Is a monarchy still an effective government or is it not? Whereas, for example, the Cartesian plane, like, we don't even give it a second thought. Or a superscript, we don't even give it a second thought, we just take it for, like, language. Hobbes obviously was more instructive in that regards, for, so Leviathan and his other writings actually tell how should the state be designed, whereas Descartes, you know, he's it's more, um, I don't know, just descriptive, and yeah, Hobbes was also, I would say, a bit more, well, definitely more controversial, Descartes, even though Descartes was considered an atheist, the same is also applied to Hobbes, but Hobbes is criticized of much, much more. The, I guess, another point of comparison, which I alluded to before, is Hobbes was much more interested in the classics. He translated Thucydides, the history of the Peloponnesian War, whereas Descartes actually was not only not interested in classics, it almost, it was sufficient in bridging, creating a gap between him and the Queen of Spain, of Sweden. Um, yeah, they both had varying loyalties. Hobbes, you know, he spent time for a, a, a noble family in England, then he was in France, he went all traveling around, then he sort of switched to the being a royalist, so he obviously moved around very Machiavellian. Same thing with the cards, was he a Protestant or was he a, a, a Catholic? He was definitely a Catholic, but that didn't stop him from spending a lot of time with Protestants and traveling throughout the world. And some could say he actually enjoyed his time better in the Netherlands because that's where he spent 20 years of his life and did all of his writing. So I would say they had varying loyalties. They were both very scientific and they were both critiqued as atheists. And um, I guess the last one I'll note is that they're kind of two contrary worldviews and that Hobbes is a nationalist, I would say, in that he believed there should be a king and the king should ultimately when possible, conquer or uh, or whatnot, but either way, there should be a king for a set group of people, whereas I think Descartes could be seen more as a globalist, believe more in globalization, and that could be seen through his, his traveling and sort of his complete negligence for borders. So, yeah, that's Thomas Hobbes and Rene Descartes. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you watch some of the ones I made in the future and some of the way, ones that I made in the past. And I highly recommend you um, read some of the specific writings on these two individuals because I think, especially as we get to more and more modern times, we're uh, still hundreds and hundreds of years out, but I think it starts to become a little bit more applicable and some of these ideas might become more relevant in a, in a modern dialogue, so. Yeah, thanks so much.